Yes, the kick last night. Hey, everyone. Hi, so I'm Patrick. I'm co-founder of a startup named Clover that I co-founded with Amber Ball Day. We both used to work at JP Morgan, where we made something called Quorum, uh, which I dare say was the most popular Ethereum stack used by businesses. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about our motivation for making Clover and then show you some of what we've been working on. Um, so this is also a little bit of a litmus test on the previous talks of today. Uh, a lot of people talked about uh, some of the things I'll talk about. So uh, show of hands, who would like to uh, explain all of these terms and then differentiate them between each other? Anyone? No, no takers. So we all know, you know, based on previous talks today, there's all these different uh, terms for essentially the same thing or at least the same motivation. Uh, and if you look at Google Trends, and I realize the irony of doing that, um, they're all kind of similarly popular and similarly, um, they, have the, they show the same kind of graph. Um, their definitions are also very similar. So if you look at uh, Brewster Kale of the Internet Archive, his definition of a decentralized web is something that uses peer-to-peer, -peer, is private, uh, so you can't be tracked, and it does not have a centralized authentication system. It's easy for content readers to uh, pay the, cons the, the producers of said content, and it's fun. He adds the qualification that it must be fun. Uh, Blockstack says it's about having your own control of your identity, data ownership, privacy, and security. Web3 Foundation says uh, you're in control of your own data, identity, and destiny. Gavin Wood, uh, co-founder of a bunch of things, uh, obviously says it's about publishing content, getting back a hash, and then being able to retrieve that again and having a global consensus network that can be used for uh, kind of a global reputation system. So if you behave badly in one area, you can get punished uh, kind of for that bad behavior across the entire internet, uh, which is an interesting distinction that nobody, uh, nobody else suggested. Uh, Gavin also adds that it must be a browser experience, which uh, is an interesting point as well. So if we zoom out a little bit, uh, this is the same graph I was showing earlier, but looking back 10 years instead of just the last year. Show of hands again, can somebody tell me what Web3 used to be? Because it was not related to blockchain. Really, nobody? Yeah, it was the semantic web. That was what Web3.0 was. Um, and the, the Wire did a, a, an article in 2010 that described the semantic web as a fully distributed web-based system for publishing logical assertions. Uh, this sounds oddly familiar. Uh, it was all about, uh, I won't go too into detail because it's already been talked about a lot today. Uh, it was about making your data available in a structured format, allowing other people to retrieve that format easily, and then uh, talking about it using these RDF tags so you could classify it and categorize it easily. And as Harry pointed out earlier, uh, it was extremely successful, but unfortunately only in one area, and that was making uh, your content work with Facebook. So if you wanted your page to show up with the right thumbnail or your video to show up in kind of a nice uh, full format, you had to add these uh, tags to your website. Uh, but it never really moved beyond that. So why is this? And uh, there's been uh, a couple of suggestions, and, and I have some. Uh, one is machines learning. So it turns out it's actually really difficult and tedious to classify all your content neatly into buckets and then have everybody else just kind of trust your classification and all that stuff. It's a lot easier to just have machines look at your content and classify it for you. It uh, could also be because business models. Uh, there's, there's no kind of uh, easy to understand uh, argument for the semantic web that businesses can understand. And therefore, there was never kind of, uh, even though the, um, the kind of the search interest in Web3 far dwarfed anything that we're talking about now, uh, there was never really an incentive for businesses to switch over. 
so here's my, my central point with this talk, and that is to not blame users for not using the best things. Uh, it all kind of approaches something uh, like an argument for PGP. So what are, we, what are we actually competing against with all this decentralized web stuff? Well, here's a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, you'll see uh, Google Photos generating albums for me. One such album that it generated was uh, the best pictures from the last three months. I don't know what best means, but Google does, and uh, I have to trust that. Uh, the other one is live albums, where I can say, oh, whenever you recognize somebody's face in a picture, I want you to automatically put this in a certain album. So basically, this is the grandmother feature. Grandmother can get pictures of my baby immediately as I take the picture, but not all of my other pictures. Um, people also expect to be able to put into Google what time is it in Berlin right now and get an answer based on natural language parsing. There is no good decentralized story for uh, that kind of um, backing for, for NLTK and, and actually doing it in a nice decentralized way. But this is how people are coming to kind of interface uh, with this. And this is not even to mention the voice control. Uh, the last example is, do I need an umbrella? And even though the most private, even the most privacy conscious people still uh, like when the computer understands it well enough to say, oh, you, I know where you are right now, and no, you don't, or yes, you do. So the good news is people care more about privacy, or at least they search more for it than they used to. The, the bad news is that it doesn't really ma matter in the grand scheme of things and compared to other things like GDPR. And uh, this just goes to show how big of an impact uh, legislation and um, compliance has on kind of what happens out there. So it's no coincidence that the GDPR interest spike spiked at the exact moment, May 15, that the law went into any kind of consequential effect. Nevertheless, it does far exceed the interest that people have uh, in privacy. At the same time, Bitcoin far dwarfs GDP, the interest in GDPR, so we all know why that is, and people like getting rich, and people especially like getting rich last year when it was part of you know, every popular song on the radio seemed to mention Bitcoin. Uh, but Bitcoin itself is not nearly as popular as something that is fun, like Fortnite. So what if we could build something that um, had not just uh, get rich quick or privacy or fun, but all of the above, and uh, compete at the same kind of uh, level of interest. So we, have, we are at a moment here uh, where things are, are a lot of the same as they were 10, 15, 20 years ago, and that's a little depressing. They're also different in a way. So a lot of uh, uh, cryptographers, uh, well-regarded cryptographers, are heralding in a new age and a renaissance of cryptography because of the advances in the space. We have new tools like zero knowledge proofs, bullet proofs, and all these things that allow us to do things that we were not able to do before, namely to hope to have any chance of doing multi-party and decentralized comp computation in a way that even uh, businesses and the people making money and investing money have uh, a reason to use the same. Uh, so what is the, the point with all this? Like, what is our motivation? It's, uh, is it to drive a specific coin or decentralize all the things for the, for the, you know, just for the sake of decentralizing? Or is it to put uh, everything everyone does on a blockchain? Uh, not really, but it is to challenge uh, the existing structures that exist in society and give more, give more control back to people. Uh, and uh, one of my um, concerns with uh, a lot of blockchain projects is that they tend to kind of or eagerly dismiss prior work if that prior work sounds boring. But if, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of lessons that are being relearned as people are building uh, these technologies, especially in the financial space. So I introduced to you the Weber Next, which is our kind of uh, ironic uh, combobulation of all these different things. 
we're trying to describe uh, the qualities that the Weber Next has. Uh, and the first one is that data can be kept close to its point of origin. So data by default does not leave the person producing it. Trust is not required for most of the tasks. Uh, the low-level platform itself is censorship resistant, but the applications that are building on top may not be. Uh, and in fact, some should not be because it's not worth uh, the effort and the, uh, the downsides. Um, the principle of least privilege applies to both data and identities. So you never give away more information than you absolutely need to answer a certain question that a provider is asking, like, is your age about 30 or 18? Uh, and finally, uh, this is the, uh, where we're being uh, uh, either ra radical or sensible, and that is that blockchains are not mandatory in this equation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, technology that uh, has existed before and is, and is genuinely useful that uh, you might not know about. So how do we keep something like this from being something that people talk about? Uh, and by this, I mean everything that's in the WebNX, D-Web, Web3, Web3.0 from being something that people talk about, oh, now it'll finally happen next year, and then the year after that, and then the year after that. This is uh, the year of the Linux desktop and the history of that meme. And it is a depressing history indeed, because already in 1999, people were making X-Files memes uh, saying, I want to believe that next year is the year uh, people are going to be using Linux on the desktop. Uh, that never happened, and Linux uh, ended up taking over a lot of other uh, device types. But uh, you know that was supposed to happen. That was just a matter of these decentralized groups working a little bit more together, giving a little less hardcore choice, and letting people uh, have something that was easy to use. But it never really materialized. So what are the core ingredients in in kind of achieving what we want to achieve? Well, we think it's, it's a combination of end user experience, developer experience, but also politics, and uh, perhaps most importantly, compatibility with people's business models. So uh, Peter, I think, was talking earlier about um, we can't, it's not really sustainable to have everything uh, working based on GIFs. And um, for, for better or worse, the world is mostly run by corporations, and if you can't, uh, offer a compelling argument why they should uh, disrupt themselves, then you have a harder time getting end user adoption as well. So what are some of these things more concretely? First one, businesses should be able to see this as an opportunity instead of a threat. Regulators should uh, you know, say enough that you can feel comfortable having any kind of token in the US, for example, which today is uh, pretty far from that. Uh, but also European legislator, legislators, it's not really clear uh, that they are informed enough uh, to have uh, blockchain be something that is legally feasible in any way. And the last thing we want to happen is something like Tor, where the uncertainty and the kind of risk by, of participating in the system far outweighs uh, the advantages, and you end up with this system that's only used by bad guys, but actually it saves a lot of people's lives. Uh, we need mass adoption whose lives are not being saved so that lives can be saved. Um, a few more things that are uh, probably obvious to a lot of you, uh, that we need uh, some kind of key management uh, scheme for people where they can lose their keys and replace it without giving a centralized entity control over their identity. And we need solutions to all kinds of protocol level problems that a lot of people are working on. Uh, but, of course, we need great developer tools as well. And so that's where Clover comes in. And this is a diagram of kind of the Weber Next stack. And this is how we see uh, ourselves fitting into this stack. Uh, it's very high level, but uh, you'll notice that we are not encapsulating the protocol level and the peer-to-peer -peer and networking stacks. We uh, are, are, you know, uh, there's a lot of great work going on in the space. There's no point in, in reinventing that stuff. Uh, again, we're pointing out that blockchain is optional. And uh, yeah, we just we think this, uh, this notion that everything has to be on a blockchain is kind of unhealthy and, and not um, useful in getting us to where we need to be, because 
uh, if you know something like BitTorrent works great for um, certain kind of transfer needs that you may have, but you're forcing a coin into the equation, uh, you may end up not, get, not getting adopted at all. Uh, so we're working at kind of the higher levels of the Web3 stack with the tooling and uh, the front end kind of uh, tools uh, to allow people to, um, to try to fulfill this, uh, this, this vision. And so some examples of uh, what we're working with, right now we're targeting all the Ethereum platforms as well as Polkadot and Substrate, uh, but we're also targeting more just peer-to-peer -peer, uh, things that are not necessarily involving a blockchain like Matrix and Lib P2P and Tor as well. Um, I'll show a little bit of an example coming up what that actually means. Uh, but like I said, uh, developer experience is, is very important. And the first kind of products that we're releasing uh, by the end of the year is um, um, not an SDK, but, but libraries and tools that allow you to um, distribute and uh, consume these uh, protocol applications in the space without us collecting any personal information, uh, accounts, private keys, or anything like that from you. And it allows you, uh, the people who are developing this software, to uh, avoid the headaches of uh, some of these different platforms, like compiling a binary for Windows is uh, surprisingly annoying. Um, and uh, last but not least, you don't need sudo or a root account to, to run any of this stuff, which ironically is uh, actually a huge thing for, for businesses because of their insanely long internal processes. So let me show you a few examples of what we've been working on so far. And uh, the first one is uh, us trying to make OK, so this doesn't work. All right, I might not be showing you examples then. All right, I can describe what's going on here. Uh, the first example, we, we uh, show how you can install Polkadot. And Polkadot is actually uh, fairly uh, good in the sense that it's uh, easy to install and it's compatible with Snap. Um, but Snap is kind of a mess. It runs Docker on your machine, needs root. Uh, we thought it could be easier than that and not require installing Rust or Cargo or any of these things. Uh, and so this shows one wget um, of one binary uh, or IPFS if you have that, and one command to download and run Polkadot uh, in a development and also mainnet uh, fashion. Second example is a web interface that you won't see, but it's the same as in the screenshots, doing the same thing. And then the third example is um, we have uh, made a bunch of integrations for VPSs and different cloud accounts. So if you have um, any kind of uh, digital ocean, Linode, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of uh, provider, you can easily spin up an instance for running something like a Polkadot or a GEF node without anything more than an API key. We're also releasing all the stuff that makes it super easy to add uh, some custom uh, provider. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's it. Um, we're looking to release uh, the first version of this in the next few months. And um, stay tuned in, in the meantime for some other things that we're, um, that we're working on. So uh, I have a few minutes for, for questions, if anyone has any. Any questions? No questions? All right, cool. All right. Well, there's one. Oh. Uh, hold on for one second okay. while the mic is coming okay. towards you. Hi. What kinds of applications and use cases uh, do you imagine people are going to show up with to use your tools first? Yeah, so in initially, it's uh, people who are consuming and using Ethereum nodes. Uh, 
more kind of medium term, we're thinking that uh, this uh, hopefully will be the easiest way to kind of uh, build and distribute uh, substrate, uh, custom chains, and more long term, uh, we're building a bunch of libraries that make it easy to accomplish certain tasks, uh, kind of um, making it agnostic which underlying chain you're using. But in the short term, it's uh, people who are uh, planning to use these nodes for whatever reason, even if that's just connecting MetaMask to a local node, uh, but also developers. Uh, there's a question over there. Any question uh, on the left side, yeah. Uh, hi, something I always wonder is, with frameworks, how can you be sure that the app is going to be the same after an update? So no, this is like a trade-off, being able to upgrade and keeping the same application. Uh, did, did you mean that, um, like, uh, Polkadot, for example, is the same after an update? Oh, yeah. I do something with this API, and I deploy it. <laughs> then there's an update. How can I be sure that the app is going to be the same? So that the, the API is going to do the same thing that it was doing before, is what I mean. Our, our APIs? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's always a challenge. And we, we have version APIs. So hopefully, you don't have API breakage. But that's at least the goal. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's definitely a challenge. And that's something we're working on now is just trying to frame out what that API means in a way where we don't have to disturb people later on. Uh, actually, I actually have one question as well. How do you make sure that sort of like how does the user verify whether they're running the right version of Polkadot? Let's say, right, I install some binary from Clover. How how can a user actually verify, or can a user verify that they're running the correct Polkadot version and not yes. some malicious code? So there's uh, two things we're doing. One is uh, well, uh, right now because we're kind of onboarding uh, everything you saw ourselves. We're signing the releases, but the goal is that the vendors themselves, like uh, the parity team, sign the parity releases, and then we distribute that. Uh, that's the easy part. I mean, downloading a, a binary and a signature uh, and having that verification happen automatically. Where we're a little more ambitious is in the uh, updating functionality. So making uh, a new Polkadot version only uh, need the binary diff uh, between the old and the new version. And that is a little more tricky. But the, the goal is definitely to have it be federated and decentralized and not uh, everything you saw here does not require a connection to our servers except uh, to download the initial uh, kind of application. Cool. Thank you. Um, any last question? I think we have time for one more question. OK, cool. Thank you very much, Thank Patrick. You.